Hey everybody, thank you all for subscribing and for all the comments lately on the X-T5 as well as the X-H2. I wanted to make this dedicated video to answer your most common questions that I'm seeing in the comments, so let's jump right into it. Okay, first question. Am I keeping my X-H2 now that I have the X-T5? So, I am shooting with the X-H2 right now. And I've said this in a couple of other videos, having the flip out screen, being able to see myself over here, as well as just having a dedicated video camera is really helpful for me in the way that I work. And then the X-T5 is definitely becoming more of a photography camera. It's a lot lighter weight, um, it's a little less bulky, and the dials are what I learned photography on, so it's a lot easier for me to use in a run and gun scenario or in a scenario like a shoot where I need to be thinking quickly. So I am going to be keeping both, um, but that's kind of the roles that they're playing. X-T5 for photos, uh, X-H2 for video. Version of this question keeps coming up, which is easier to use, X-H2 or X-T5? No one outright asked that, but there's a lot of questions of like, are the dials hard to adjust to on the X-H2? Is it worth it? I would say <laughs> I got the X-H2 first because it came out sooner. It was an adjustment. <laughs> I was impressed by the camera, impressed by the body. It felt like a pro Fuji body, which I had never really had before. But yeah, I mean, my brain was having some trouble adjusting to the way that it works. When I picked up the X-T5, it immediately clicked. You know, all the muscle memory came back of when I had the X-T3. It's just easier for me personally because I learned on that system. So I think that's what it comes down to. Do you have a preference? Have you used a Fuji camera in the past? Or are you using a different system like a Canon or a Nikon that uses a PASM dial, in which case the XH2 will probably be easy for you to pick up on. How does eye tracking work on the new sensors? I keep getting specific questions about animal tracking. I think some of you may be wildlife photographers. I mean, I'm looking at this right now. It's got me. <laughs> like, it's got my eye. The box never leaves me. I think what this new sensor does differently is tracking subjects better. I think Fuji's been able to track eyes for a long time and, and been doing it well. I think the adjustment here is more so just snappier when it's not something obvious to the sensor like a person. I do take a lot of pictures of the cats. <laughs> I never have trouble getting them in focus either. Um, but again, I would also say like the biggest thing there is make sure you're shifting your focus modes all the time. I will say, like, even on the older sensor, I struggled with eye tracking because I didn't know those things and wasn't using those settings. I thought the camera would just do it for me. So that would be my biggest recommendation. That being said, huge upgrade with autofocus on the new sensor. Eye tracking is not a problem. I would say the big leap in performance is with subjects or things that aren't people that don't have a very obvious eye for the sensor to hook onto. Do I regret switching from Canon? No. <laughs> One thing I will say about the Canon system, the RF system specifically, the EF system is like a totally different conversation. The RF system, those lenses were sharp AF. <laughs> Even the cheaper lenses, tack sharp. That's one thing I will give to them. What I will say about Fuji though is with the new 40 megapixel sensor, that same sharpness is here. I don't think it's the lenses because the lenses, yeah, these are newer lenses like the, uh, the linear motor ones, but I don't ever remember <laughs> Fuji on the X-T3 being that sharp. It's the extra pixels in this 40 megapixels that makes things look super sharp. So that's not a problem here. Do I miss Canon? No, like not at all. The lack of affordable glass, the lack of prosumer glass that was like in the middle, like F1.4, you either had to get like $3,000 1.2 glass or like $500 1.8 glass, but it was like super distorted and cheap. There was nothing in the middle and they were blocking people like Sigma from making that mid-range glass. So I think the third party news, like the third party lens news from Canon was one of the things that really tipped me over the edge. But I will say I was already missing Fuji and like I said in some videos, I kept an X-T30 because I just, I it felt natural to me. I think I fell into the full frame hype. Which brings me to my next question here. Do I miss anything about full frame? Okay, with the old X-T3 system that I had, I was using the F2 glass. Now, that's great glass, I'm not saying that is bad. What I will say though is when you invest in the 1.4, the 1.2 glass for Fuji, it starts to become closer to apples to apples. The depth of field 
looks a lot more like a full frame sensor. And I don't think I was able to realize that in the past because I didn't have that higher prosumer glass. Okay, what lenses do I recommend for the X-T5? This is a hard question because I mean, lenses are very subjective to the work that you're doing, in my opinion. Um, whether, you know, you want to shoot primes or zooms is also a personal preference. For me, I will tell you that the lens that keeps coming back onto the body is the 33 1.4 by Fuji. You know, it's funny because I always gravitated towards a 35 millimeter equivalent, so that would have been like the 23. The 33 on here, I've never liked 50 millimeters. Like when I had Canon and stuff, I really didn't. But on this this lens is very compact and it gives you just enough compression that you get a really cool look even with very simple photos and it does feel like an all-purpose lens like you can't it's not so zoomed in that you can't take a couple steps back but it's also not so wide that you're like missing some of the depth of field. I do want to do a video dedicated to all the lenses that I have and kind of breaking down which are my favorite and giving you reviews of each so stay tuned for that. Another question around lenses that I've been getting a lot is, do third-party lenses work on the X-T5 and the X-H2? So if you watch some of my recent videos, you'll see that I've been saying, and just to also clarify, I am shooting this with the 13 millimeter Viltrox 1.4 right now, and it's tracking me great, as you guys can see. We haven't lost focus. Um, it looks beautiful behind me. Like, these are very good lenses. I have the 13 mil 1.4 by Viltrox. I also started out with the 23 1.4. And if you watch my X-H2 photo video, you'll see some samples with that lens. I'll link that below. Basically, these lenses are good, and I would definitely recommend them if you're on a budget, if you're looking to, if it's, if it's get this, or get the, like, f2.8s get this because again the blur and the look is much more pro in my opinion that being said i have noticed just like a slight difference and it's really hard to put my finger on just a hair sharper with the fuji lenses also just the autofocus is a hair better with the fuji lenses as well the average consumer is not going to notice the difference i am noticing the difference because when i'm on shoots like like family photo shoots where i have to be like click, 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 firing away, you will notice focus breathing, a little bit of hunting, and it's not much, it's minimal, but with the third-party lenses, whereas with the Fuji lenses, didn't miss a beat, didn't miss focus, um, so that, I think, is the deciding factor for me. Again, you can't go wrong with these lenses, these aren't bad, um, and I will do some comparison videos so that you guys can see, like, the 13 versus the 18, um, the 23 from Viltrox versus the 23 from Fuji. I think that'll help illustrate it more. Okay, last thing on the subject of lenses, because I keep getting this comment, why did I get the 50 f1 versus the new 56 1.2? So again, falling into the full frame hype, here comes Booney. Basically, I felt like the f1.0 would give me more of that full frame look for portraiture. Um, I was thinking about shooting weddings and engagement shoots and other things that I often do for people and I was thinking that the more blur the better. What I'll say though is this lens is hefty. It's big um, and I find myself not using it as often because it's very cumbersome. It fits nicely on the X-H2 but on the X-T5 it feels out of place. So there is definitely a part of me that wonders if maybe I should swap that out for the 56, the new one. The other thing is the minimum focusing distance on the 1.0 isn't really that great. I probably should have researched that as well. The 1.2 sounds like you can get really close on the new one. So again, considering doing that swap, it's kind of a hassle to do that. So I'll see, you know, if I do get the 56 in here, the new one, I will definitely do a video. Maybe I'll rent it first and, and that'll be the best way. Next question, what mode do I shoot in? So I always shoot in manual. Um, I've been getting some questions of like, do I use aperture priority? I don't. Um, I always shoot in manual. What I will say though is I shoot in JPEG plus RAW because I've been experimenting with film simulations. Usually do autofocus continuous. If I'm doing b-roll for these videos and I'm trying to get a b-roll shot of a product, single point is a little bit easier for that. But yeah, continuous is also ideal when you're shooting people because it allows you to um, do the eye tracking and that's a lot of the work that I do, paid work, so that's kind of where I am with that. You guys want to see one? Say hi, Bo. Don't worry, it's on human eye tracking. That's why it's not catching her. All right, what's my favorite film simulation? So 
I gave a film recipe in a recent video, the XH2 video that I actually have linked below that I mentioned earlier. Basically, it's a variation of classic chrome. So I've been trying a lot of different ones. I do want to try to create one that looks more like Portia, but basically it's a variation of classic chrome. I think the big trick with film simulations, and this is like maybe a little bit of a hot take, but all the film simulations look awesome, in my opinion. The way to make it look more like whatever you want is to adjust the white balance. So it's not just, you know, is a daylight, tungsten, whatever. If you go to auto white balance and then actually shift the color space from, you know, just standard to a little bit more red or a little bit more blue or a little bit more green, that's how you can really manipulate the look to look the way that you want. My base almost always is classic chrome. Um, and I think a lot of film recipes use that. So that would be where I would start if you're new. All right. I know this video was a little bit long, I think. Um, but hopefully this answered a lot of your questions. Definitely feel free to leave more comments below with questions and I will do a second Q and A sometime in the near future. Be sure to subscribe for all those lens videos that I've been talking about. Thank you guys so much for watching. Really appreciate all your support lately and I will talk to you soon.